Perfect. Uh, City of Fort Lauderdale is hosting Board of Adjustment meetings in both a virtual and in-person format. Any member of the public that is interested in speaking before the Board of Adjustment virtually is required to complete the virtual speaker card. Any member of the public that is interested in speaking uh, before the Board of Adjustment in person may sign up to speak at the meeting or may or by using the virtual speaker card. So all of you out there who are lining up to speak, please just make sure that you sign a speaker's card. Um, due to COVID-19 distance requirements, there's very limited seating available. Therefore, we are encouraging members of the public to participate virtually whenever possible. Not you. Um, the public will be able to listen and view Board of Adjustment meetings at www.fortlauderdale.gov uh, forward slash FLTV, www.youtube.com forward slash City of Fort Lauderdale, as well as Comcast Channel 78 and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. To speak on an agenda item, you can't really click on the link below because you don't have the link below because I'm speaking as opposed to showing it to you. To participate in the meeting, you can fill out the virtual meeting form on the city's website on the Board of Adjustment page. Individuals who wish to speak will be heard prior to the close of public comment period. If you have trouble signing up, please email Shaquilla Crawford Williams at chcrawford at fortlauderdale.gov any caller that is unidentified will not be provided with access to the meeting. So please provide your name and address. Note, if you would like to share a document, please upload the document when submitting a request to speak. Participants, please remember to mute yourself, actually mute your phones or your computers, not necessarily yourself. If you are not speaking and silence your devices so that we do not hear interference, which would be a nice thing for all of us board members, if you guys make sure that you're Muted. So I'd like to call this meeting to order. Bridget, do you want to do a roll call? Yes, sir. Uh, Vice Chair Patrick McTeague. Here. Eugenia Ellis. Here. Carrie Villeneuve. Here. Thank you. Douglas Reynolds. Present. Blaze McGinley. Present. Thank you. Uh, Chadwick Maxey. Here. Uh, our alternate Chip Falkinger, I believe he's left the building. Some excuse. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Shelly Eichner, alternate. Here. Mike Lambrick's alternate. Here. And Chair Howard Nelson. Here. We do have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, let's move to the Pledge of Allegiance. Chadwick, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? In each one of your packets, you should have a copy of the minutes of last month's meeting. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Uh, moved by Ms. Ellis, is there a second? Second. And seconded uh, by Mr. McGinley. Any questions, comments, modifications, deletions, alignments? Hearing none, all in favor of, of uh, approving the minutes? Aye. 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 All opposed? Please show unanimous approval, Bridget. All right, so announcements. Each member of the public that wishes to speak after each item is presented and discussed will have three minutes per item. Representatives of associations and groups will have five minutes. To participate in the meeting, you can fill out the virtual meeting form on the city's website, which is what we just went through, so we don't really need to, to repeat it. Um, why don't we introduce the uh, first agenda item and we will swear it in. Item number one is case PLN BOA 2003-0003. Who here is representing that item? Ms. Toothaker? Yes, Stephanie Toothaker on behalf of the applicants. Ms. Toothaker, are, are you 
ready to begin, we'll do, we will do uh, Wadir in a second, but are you ready to begin? I am. I would just ask that Stephanie Mayorga be promoted to a panelist so that she can share a screen. Can, uh, can the IT people do that? I'm seeing a thumbs up. So before we do contact and then um, Ms. Toothaker, before you start, I've got a question for the city attorney um, that I'm gonna ask him to answer before we move forward. But Mr. McGinley, Mr. McGinley any contact? I spoke with counsel. Spoke with counsel. Mr. Maxey? Spoke with applicants counsel. Spoke with applicants counsel. Let's go through the online. Uh, Mr. McTeague. Phone call with applicants counsel. Very good. Ms. Ellis. A conversation with counsel. Mr. Reynolds. None. Mr. Villeneuve. Conversation with counsel. I'd, I'd ask Mr. Falkinger, but he's not going to answer us. Ms. Eichner. Uh, none. And if you have a quorum, do you need the alternates? How Do we have a quorum without the alternates, Bridget? Yes, we do. Um, I would ask that perhaps we should find out if there's any um, problems with the second item before the alternates leave. Well, so let me just reach out to board members. I didn't see any filed conflicts that would prevent anybody from sitting on item one. How about item two? Not seeing um, any. Ms. Eichner, if you, if you want to leave, you're free to. If you want to hang out, it's a fun party. <laughs> I think I'll pass, I'll pass on this party and uh, enjoy your evening. I, I can't believe you would do that to us. Uh, Very good. Right, no, go, go join Mr. Falcon during his birthday party. It's okay. Will do. Thanks a lot. Bye, guys. Okay, so let me go through. I got to Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Villeneuve, any, any contact? I spoke with counsel. Got it. And I also spoke with counsel. And we have no alternates. So... Um, Mr. Mr. Baker, if, if you would allow me to ask the board's counsel one question before we start, just so I'm clear as to what we need to look at and not look at for this. Mr. Assistant City Attorney, um, I had previously asked you a question regarding the concept of race judicata on the rehearing of an item. Mm -hmm. And I know you gave me some advice, but you may want to share it for the record as to whether or not race judicata, a, a form decision applies and, and Ms. Duthaker must also get past the race judicata issue in her presentation. So in this case, it does not apply. Our code provides for the uh, process for hearing rehearings and once the determination, uh, once the determination has been made by the board at the public hearing to consider the rehearing, the item is placed before the board as if uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it de novo, but as if it's a, uh, a fresh case. So Perfect. all evidence is admissible at this time. Thank you. Ms. Toothaker, did you hear that? I did. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay. And uh, the floor is yours. Well, me, but, I'm Chair, sorry, we did not swear in yet. Yeah. Thank you, Bridget. Okay, no problem. Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give this evening will be the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, first, let me just say thank you so much to the Board of Adjustment for allowing us the opportunity to present this, um, this variance request to you and for granting our motion for a rehearing. With me this evening is a Stephanie Mayorga who works with me at my firm. And Gerard and Daphne Diafe are also on the line and they, um, I know you met them when they came before you prior to this evening. And, and Chair, I wanna thank you for the question of, of um, is, we had discussed whether this was race judicata and it was my understanding. And Duane, thank you for your opinion because it was my understanding that this is a, a fresh start. I, I like de novo, but if you don't wanna use that terminology, I certain understand, certainly understand that. Um, but this is an opportunity for us to present this to you in the way that the board is accustomed to seeing these presentations, which is that we will go through what we believe are justifications for a variance. And we believe that we do meet the criteria for a variance. So I asked Estefania to get on because I am what's known as a tech tard and I am not capable of sharing screens. So Estefania will do that 
for me. So, um, so first of all, this is um, a property that you're familiar with. We are asking for a waiver of variance from the minimum rear, rear yard requirement, which is section 47-531 table of dimensional requirements for the RS8 zoning district to allow an existing covered patio roof, which is an after the fact permit and it would uh, remain in the rear yard setback of two feet from the property line, but I'd like to, to delve into that a little bit deeper. So next slide. This is the property. One thing that's very unique about this property is that it sits on a cul-de-sac and it's bounded on two sides by water. So this is not a typical RS8 zoning uh, single family home that sits on a, on a normal size lot. You've got, a, you've got a unique shaped lot. You've got a lot that's got some awkward angles in it and awkward corners. And in fact, when the Diafes purchased this home, the home was already there. It was an existing home with an existing patio and existing pool in the existing location. So they're asking for variance for the shade structure, which they added to accompany structures that were already in place and that were already situated on this lot in the exact configuration that you see today. So it, it sort of dictated how the lot could be used, what was already there. You weren't gonna move the home to try to comply with, um, with the RS8 zoning district. So next slide. So, as I discussed, you know, the home was already existing. The table of dimensional requirements actually says that a 25 foot um, setback is required. But I think what, what we've done here, because this structure sits on the property in a very odd way, is that we're defining the back as a 15 foot, um, 15 foot from, if you'll go back, Estefania, we were at 25, there we go. So what I've done, and I think this is really important. This is one thing that didn't, when I went back and, and watched the video and I read all the minutes, I, it wasn't clear. I think to the board, it wasn't presented in a way that, that you're accustomed to seeing. I think what's really important to note here on this slide is that the existing seawall is not the setback. So on paper, when you're considering a variance for the setback, it looks like it's this, this very extreme setback that gets you only down to two feet. But if you look here at this, what I'm showing you where I've drawn these lines, this, the, the actual property line is, is significantly far from the from the seawall. And when then when the Diafes looked at what everybody else in this Riverland area has and said, you know, we'd like to have the same thing and built it, they were looking at the seawall as if that was their property line, which was a little bit of a misunderstanding. And in fact, when you see it on paper, and I'm going to show you an aerial later that shows you this 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 um, covered patio is actually quite far from what most people to the naked eye would perceive as the property line. That's what causes the need for such a such an extreme extreme variance, which in actuality, you know, when you apply common sense, you, you see that it's not really that big of a set of a, of a variance from what you would perceive to be their actual property line, because the property line and the seawall are not the same thing in this case. So I've drawn for you here where the 25 feet in. I think what's really significant about this is that if you look at the 25 foot setback from the property line, that's the home. That is where the home sits. You couldn't have any shade structure that would exceed the home, which most of us have. Most of us, and particularly those that, you know, that have pools in their backyard, they like to have a pool, you know, with some kind of shade structure so that you can enjoy your pool in a different, in a different way, way that most of us do. So let's go to the next slide. So here's where the 15 foot setback is. And so this is what's been applied here because I think the 15 foot setback is, you know, you, you because they're on two sides. So even at the 15 feet, you can see that there's a pretty dramatic difference between the existing seawall and the actual property line. And when you draw the 15 feet from the existing seawall, it's actually, it, it's actually quite, a, a quite normal situation that you would see here. So it's it's very similar to what you would see throughout this neighborhood, throughout the Riverland neighborhood. And even at the 15 feet, I, I know one of the discussions that I've had is, is would it be possible for them to, to, to pull this shade structure back and put it within the setback. I think you can see that if, if really what your purpose is is to sit by your pool, like all of your neighbors are doing and enjoy your pool in a shaded area. And I think they've got a fire pit. I've got a fire pit, a lot of people do, you know, for those four cool days a year that we get. 
you know, you're not really going to be able to do that. If you pull this shade structure back, I, frankly, I, I personally think you would just rem remove it entirely. It doesn't really work. It doesn't look right. It's not, you know, it's not congruous with the way the pool sits on the property. And I think it would just, it would be sort of an awkward use of the property to do, um, to do a shade structure that actually complies with that setback. And you can, you can see why. Even if you were to do 15 feet from the seawall, which is what most people perceive as their property line, it's still a very awkward line. Um, so I, I felt like this was a very important diagram for you to see because again, on paper, it looks like they're asking for this very extreme, you know, 13 foot uh, variance, but in, in actuality to the naked eye, it really doesn't look like that when you look at that. And so I'm gonna show you some pictures that I think, um, I think also kind of tell that picture. If you'll go to the next slide. So here, this is a really good image here, the one on the left that I'm showing you, because what you see is that that shade structure really is, is compliant with the pool itself. And as I said, when they purchased this property, the pool and the deck were already there. They purchased it and said, you know what, it would be so nice for, for our, our, our daughter and our dogs and for us to be able to sit out in the sun and enjoy our pool you know, which is what people do because Florida is hot, you know, like I said, except for the, the couple of days a year that it's, that it's cool, it's hot and you want to be in the shade and to be able to really enjoy your pool unless you want to bake in the sun, you're going to want some kind of shade structure to be able to do that. But what's really dramatic about this picture on the left is if you look where those posts come down that are, that are um, in direct lineage with the, with the pool deck, two feet from that is, is right next to it. So that's what I'm saying, you know, if you go down to where the where the the actual seawall is where you see that chain link fence, that's way that that's all, you know, city property and that's a very common situation in Florida as you all know, a lot of us have pieces of our property that are actually some people actually own into the water, some people actually have land that goes into the water that's technically owned by the city or fined. And so, you know, so again, on paper it doesn't really tell the real story of the variance that they're asking for because in fact the, the this shade structure sits quite far back from from the seawall and that's a common seawall that's a seawall that goes up and down the river that they live on if you look at the image on the right i think one thing that's really important and i'm going to talk about this a little bit more as well is this is the property that is on the left, on the on the left side of the bushes, is the property that is the most affected property by virtue of this shade structure, and you can see that just by height of the of the um, of the podocarpus, you actually can't even see it. But I, more importantly, I want to I want to go even further and share with you. Um, some what I think is is hopefully some good news, and that is that we have um, actually gotten a letter of support from from that neighbor. So Stephanie, if you'll go to the next slide. So I think it's really important to talk about why we think that we meet the variance requirements. So the first criteria is that special conditions and circumstances affect the property at issue, which prevent the reasonable use of such property. So as I said, the property was purchased in, um, it was built in 1961 prior to the Riverland area being annexed into the city of Fort Lauderdale. Um, the the Diafes, they, they purchased the house in its existing location with the pool and the deck in its existing location. And so to have any kind of shade structure that would, that would complement the pool so that you could sit outside and enjoy the outside without being in the baking sun, you really could only put it where they put it. There's not really anywhere else that you could put that, that shade structure. So I think that does, in Florida, particularly because shade is so important to us, I think that does um, in fact, prevent the reasonable use of their backyard area. So next slide. So the next one is that circumstances which cause the special conditions are peculiar to the property at issue or to such small number of properties that they clearly constitute a market exception of other properties in the same zoning district. So one thing that I'm going to show you, um, and it's the next couple of slides, is that in fact, um, I get I sent the Diafes on a little on a little um, boating trip, and I told them go around. I want you to go go boat around uh, to all of your neighbors in this area, and I want you to take pictures of everybody that has a shade structure that looks just like this, because in fact it is a very 
common scenario in the Riverland area. Again, these homes, they're, the, the lots are, are, their lot in particular is shaped very differently from the other lots because of the way it sits on a cul-de-sac. And people that are, you know, obviously it's a benefit to live on, on two sides of water, but you also get dinged a little bit because your, you know, your property is a little bit more public, you've got, you know, more access. And so, um, more visual access from, from neighbors is what I mean. And so I, I do think that those are particular to this property. The cul-de-sac, the location of the house when they purchased it, the location of the pool and the deck were all there already. So next slide. The literal application of the ULDR would deprive them of a substantial property right that is enjoyed by other property owners in the same zoning district. I do think that also um, as it relates to all the neighboring properties around them, that the way that these houses tend to sit on these properties in the Riverland area is also particular to Riverland. You don't see that in other neighborhoods in the city of Fort Lauderdale, but I do believe that that, that literal application um, denies them essentially the, the use of their property. So, you know, if they're if they're not in the pool and enjoying the pool, they most people wouldn't be able to sit out there. I personally can't sit outside for too long. I think we just, it's too hot in Florida. You've got to be able to create shade. And let's be honest, you know, tr a tree is not going to do it. You've got to have some kind of shade structure to really enjoy your property in the way, and, and we want to be outside. That's a, that's a, that's a, you know, an ability to use your property in the way that we, you know, that draws us Floridians here. And, um, and I do think that that is uh, something that has been traditionally granted. So here's some of the images that, um, that I asked them to go take in, which you can see these are properties that are that surround them, that are all around uh, in this area where they live. And you can see shade structures going in some cases right up, you know, right up to the, the and I don't know where these people's property lines, but I can, I can clearly see, we can all see that these are pretty darn close to the seawall. And this is a very common scenario in the Riverland area. So I don't think that the Daffys are asking for anything that their neighbors don't enjoy. Here's some more. We just, we took just a, a bunch of them. They're all, they're all over the place. It's very easy if you go up and down these waterways here in this area, you can see that this is a common scenario. And again, it's Florida. So we wanna be, we wanna be under shade. We wanna be outside, but we wanna enjoy, enjoy some shade. So next slide. So the unique hardship is not self-created by the applicant or the predecessors, and it's not a, a not a disregard. So I think we've acknowledged that um, that Gerard, when he built this structure, didn't uh, frankly, you know, didn't pull permit, and we we acknowledge that. That's a that's unfortunately that does happen, but they have gone through a great deal of difficulty, and I don't think we need to belabor it again. I know you heard a full presentation, but the the structure has been certified. It does meet wind loads. It is built to the standards of the Florida Building Code, and from that perspective, it could be um, could be accepted if this board would find it upon themselves to to grant their their ability to continue to use it. And as I said, the the home was existing on the uh, you know was existing when they purchased it. The pool was in its existing location. They weren't. It wasn't a total disregard. Like I'm just this is where I want my my house to be built, and this is where I want the pool, and this is where I want the deck, and so I'm just going to put it wherever I want on the property. It wasn't like that. They purchased a property that was already built upon, and they worked with what they had. So next slide. And we do believe this is the minimum minimum variance. I showed you some um, some images not only of you know the property line, the unique uh, aspect of the fact that the property line and the seawall are are quite far from each other, that the um, the shade structure is built in a way that it complements the pool uh, and the existing of the existing location of the pool, and it was built over the deck that was already there. So um, and you can see just from a visual. Uh, perspective of, you know, something that's visually pleasing, you want that to not be an awkward location off to the side in a, in a weird spot. You want that to be at the end of your pool, like a beautiful, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's beautiful the way they did it. It's a, you know, it's a nice area. And I know from talking with them that they enjoy that space a great deal with their neighbors which leads me to the neighbors. And, um, and I, I, uh, you can skip this one, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, we spent a lot of time talking to our neighbors, and um, and most importantly, I know that in the prior hearing you heard from our neighbor uh, Brian McCallum, and Brian is shown here um, depicted as home number three. The Diafes here are the one that's in a dash line, and Brian um, Brian is in home number three, so he would be the neighbor that would be most affected by this. And what I'm showing you here 
this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Those are all the neighbors that submitted letters of support for this shade structure. Most importantly, Brian, who is the most affected, submitted a letter, and I've got it in the packets. So I'll show it to you in just a minute, saying that this shade structure has no no negative impact on him, and he supports it. And I I know I know there was a there was a fairly heated hearing last time. Um, the Daffes and Mr. McCollum have have spoken to each other, have have created a, just a great neighborly relationship. And my understanding is that Brian, you know, said that he was very supportive and very, you know, sorry that he that he had fought it. There was a little misunderstanding b between the neighbors, but I think we've solved that. I want to share with you real quickly because I, in case you're wondering. The homes that are not shaded, um, the one immediately to the north of us, those are th that's a that's a rental home, um, and so the um, the owners are are absent, and the the neighbors that are across the water from the Diafes, they do know them. They did try to reach them, um, had been told verbally that they did the neighbors didn't have any issues with it, but just weren't able to get a letter in time. So we really did try to make sure that every surrounding property that would in any way be affected by this shade structure was um, was in favor of it. And we have submitted all of these letters and those are in your packet. Um, Stephanie, you can just go to them real quickly. So we just, what we did here is we just showed you, you know, we've got these letters and we just targeted, you know, with the red line. So you can see who wrote the letters. And most notably is the letter here on the right from Mr. McCallum, which says in regards to the above reference case, I live directly east of the property next to the structure in question. I'm actually the only person affected by the structure. I would like to state that I have no objection to the variance being granted. The structure does not affect my use or the enjoyment of my property. I see no reason to not grant the variance. I hope this helps in your decision. And then the next uh, page is just the rest of the letters. I don't need to read them all to you. I think Brian's letter pretty much uh, says it all. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions and I know uh, Daphne and Gerard are on as well if you have any questions of them. Perfect, thank you very much, Ms. Toothaker. Let me turn it to the board quickly for questions before we open up the rest of the public hearing. Um, Chadwick, questions? Yeah, I just have uh, one quick question. Based on my memory, I thought they had constructed this was you, you, you had they no they they did construct it okay. they constructed so they constructed the shade structure not the home the pool or the deck that, that was my only question thank you yes. okay. mr mcginley no questions let me go and i'm gonna reserve my questions for for the last uh mr mcteague any questions sorry yeah. no i do not okay Ms. Ellis, any questions? Um, not at this time. Okay. Uh, Mr. Reynolds. Yes. Is there any way that the shade coverage could be reduced? We looked at that. Um, we were we were asked that and we did look at it. There is a way to, at great expense, um, there is a way to scale it back by doing um, a cantilever because it's actually the post. I think that are causing the issue. It is um, it is a very expensive scenario, and I know that's not one of your criteria. Um, and it, it creates an awkward, uh, at best, situation on the inside. It can be done, um, by but you still need a variance for it. You still need the variance because of the situation with the seawall and the property line. So could you achieve a variance and have the coverage that they've given the benefit of the pool without having such a large roof? Um, Stephanie, do you, do you want me to go back? If I could go back to that one, I would show, I'll can show you where it is without a variance. So as I saw the photograph, it looked like it was a pretty large area covered. Um, go back to um, slide three if you can. So if you're applying the 25 foot setback, then you can't have anything. If you see that. But, but what is the, what's the determining setback? Well, it's, it's a little confusing. Go to the 15 foot. Setback, it's a 25 foot setback because if, of the waterway. If you do the 15 feet so that there's no setback, obviously we wouldn't need to be here. Um, that I think at that point where you see the 15 foot setback from property line, they would just take it down because it, it would be awkward and useless. 
does he need to be set back from the water line, even though the water line uh, is not from the property? property. Yes. So, and so there, but I, don't, I don't know if McGinley's we can hear you asking, clearly on the record. Right. Mr. McGinley is asking, asking a question with respect to the seawall and the property line. And as I understand it, the seawall, which most people visually look at for delineation of setback, is not the property line. The property line is actually several feet landward of the seawall. So application from the property line, which is the ownership, right. moves you farther into the property. It's eight feet, the seawall is eight feet, eight inches from the property line. It extends another eight feet, eight inches, but we don't get to measure from the seawall, we measure from the property line. Got it. Okay, M Mr. Reynolds, does that end your questions or do you have another question? No, how much, how many square foot is this, um, I'll call it the patio roof, how large is it? I'm gonna have to defer to Gerard, I don't know the answer to that question. It just in the picture, one of the pictures, it looked quite substantial. It, it extends the short length of the pool. You can see it's, 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 ha it's shown here in purple. I don't know the square footage of it, but it extends along the short side of the pool. About We're happy to give a quick measurement if you'd like. Okay, thank you. That's, um, that's Daphne speaking, if she can. It's about 260 plus square feet. So Mr. McGinley, our architect on the board, says it's about how much? 260, give or take. About 260 square feet. I would prefer the applicant uh, provide. That makes sense. That's <laughs> no further questions. Thank you, Chair. We'll get it for you. All right. Well, while, while we're, uh, well, uh, before we get there, Mr. Villeneuve, any questions? No questions from me. So, Ms. Toothaker, I've, I've got a couple. You already answered one of mine, which is I was going to ask you to go through the letters, which you did. Thank you very much. One of the reasons for the enhanced setback on waterways is to preserve the view down the waterway. Is there anything else that obstructs that view down the waterway? Can you go back to the aerial? I don't think this obstructs the view because of the seawall, the location of the seawall. Well, but but I'm talking about the the 25 foot setback. Go back to the aerial, right? So how far out does that tree and then hedge extend out? Because in my mind, that's really the 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 view blocking issue on that waterway, not necessarily the structure. Let me. We've got a better image, um, Stephanie. Stephanie, go to the one. There we go. See the so the tree and the and the hedge are actually in the setback. That's they're clearly in the setback because the, the property line is two feet from where you see the deck end. Well, it looks like the hedge and, and tree are all the way to the edge of the seawall. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Which in my mind would be would be the view obstructing issue. So I that's, I, I know Mr. Reynolds asked you asked you about the size of it, and I know we're gonna get an answer on the square footage, but I think your question mostly dealt with the the length of how far back into the property. What percentage of the width of the backyard is this variance? We were not asked to do that calculation. Stephanie, will you go back to the, um, the aerial, I think, is probably the best. So, I mean, that's not- um, 20 to 25%? Not even, that's not even a quarter. Okay. I've got no further questions. So Mr. Chair, yeah. if I may, in, in the discussion about this, it's a canopy. It's open on all sides. So from a, a visual obstruction, I can't see how it would obstruct a view. These yeah, are and I think the view is already obstructed by, by the hedge anyways. But that's what I'm saying, not the structure, but by the hedge. Yeah. Can I answer your question? On sure. the length? Okay, so the, the measurement is 20 feet from the edge of our house as a cover out to the edge of the pool patio, uh, where you see. About uh, 13 feet wide. And it's 13 feet wide, so 20 by 13. And the hedge, by the way, that I think you're, just, you're um, mentioning, that's sort of behind uh, the patio area, 
that goes up to the seawall is in fact coming over the top of our fence and is part of Brian McCallum's property. The hedge but is actually- and, and a legally existing obstruction, but the obstruction nonetheless. Yes. Okay, so fair enough. 20 by six, oh. 20 by 13. It's uh, 260 feet, which uh, I get. <laughs> wow. Well done, Blaze. You know, you nailed 260, that. You, you missed by 10 feet. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Here. Yes, ma'am. Um, we wanted to make sure that the homeowners were sworn in. Bridget, were they sworn in? Well, the homeowners haven't. Oh, I'm sorry. No, they haven't been. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharif. Stephanie. Gaffney Gaff and, and Gerard, you, you need to be sworn in, please. Yep, no problem. Sorry about that. Bridget, you want to? Yes, I please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you've given and will give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, and your name, please? Daphne Duffay. Thank you. So, Ms. Duffay, I, I heard the 13 feet wide. Do you have any idea how wide your lot is? You mean from all the property lines as far as the... Yeah, yeah. I believe we submitted the survey. That's all I could tell you. I don't know, but the survey was provided initially. Yeah. Based on, it was by Land Tech. It was done by Land Tech. Approximately 75 feet. That way. Thank so you. I've got to do math. Hold on one second. Yeah, um, this two thing, you're right. It's well below 25%. Yeah. Oh, you mean how much of this is that? I see. Right, 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 right. I can't believe you guys are making me do higher math. Like, yeah. <laughs> chair, it's it's seventy five feet along the along the the waterway, but it's but the um, the property extends beyond the property line on both sides of the canal. So it so the property itself goes goes out on both sides. Okay. But roughly. Yeah, twenty percent of the property. Thank you. That that was the answer I was looking for. Any more questions from the board? If not, I will open it up to public comment. Let me open the public hearing. Any members of the public that are signed up to speak, you will be called individually. Please state your name and address for the record. Speakers will have three minutes, and representatives, associations, and groups will have five minutes. Do we have any speakers signed up on this matter? Keitha? No? In that case, let's close the public hearing. Um, Stephanie, there, there, there was no additional comment, so do you need any rebuttal? I don't, thank you. We appreciate your consideration. Any, any closing argument? Thank you. <laughs> we we hope that you know we 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 spent the time. Um, I think the Diapes recognize uh, you know they did build the structure without permits. We've had that discussion. I think a lot of us here you know deal with this, and um, they've spent a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, and you know and uh, and we did spend a lot of time with the neighbors and trying to make sure that um, that we were not having any negative impact on the neighbors. They 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 really did. Um, go out and and proactively spoke to as many people as they could. Any any home that wasn't um, wasn't designated was either because the person was out of town, not available. But you can see that everybody that surrounds them is very supportive. I know that they're very well liked by their neighbors, and their neighbors have actually spent a good deal. If you read the letters, you can see the neighbors actually spent a good time, deal of time in this shade structure and enjoy it and hope that it um, that it can stay. So we we really do appreciate your consideration and 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 really appreciate you giving us the opportunity to to have a rehearing and present to you this evening. Right. Thank you. Um, I noticed board members have all had a chance for questions. Are there any remaining board questions? In that case, let me close the public hearing and do we have a motion? Mr. Maxey? Mr. McGinley, do we have a motion? A motion. Sure. Uh, I will make a motion to approve uh, PLN BOA 2003003 as uh, written. Um, because it meets the requirements for the issuance of a variance under the city code? Because it meets the requirements of the issuance of a Do we have a second for that motion? 
Mr. Chair, I'll second. Ms. Ellis seconds. Any discussion among the boards? If not, Bridget, will you call the roll? Yes, Mr. Chair. And was that Mr. Maxey making the motion? Yes, it was. Okay. Um, just a comment. Speak face first into the mic when you turn to your left or right. I lose your, your audio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Ms. Ellis. Yes. Mr. Villeneuve. Yes. Mr. Reynolds. Yes. Mr. McGinley. No. Mr. Maxey. Yes. Vice Chair McTeague. Yes. Chair Nelson. Yes. Motion passes. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. We 61. Thank you. All right. Next item. Case number PLN Board of Adjustment 2011. 0002. Mr. Crush. Vice Chair, if I could just uh, interrupt just for a second for yes, a uh, small piece of business. Um, the city would like to strike the second code section of the variance as it. The, uh, the variance we just heard or the variance we're about to hear? One that we're about to hear. Oh, for, for the city, we're asking to strike the second ULDR section. The 25.3A3B Romanet 2? Correct, as it does not apply for uh, under uh, residential to residential for uh, neighborhood compatibility. So, and just so we're abundantly clear for, for both my purposes, city attorney's purpose, and the applicant's purpose, you're asking to strike it because a variance is not needed for this section for that development, correct? That's correct. Jason, we, we hold on one second because we can't hear you. Is this thing on? Now is it on? Hey. There we go. Oh, sorry about that. Bridget, did we, we need to, and before you start, do we need to swear anybody in, Bridget? Sit down. You're not talking. <laughs> yes. Anybody that's going to speak on this item, uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll start over. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jason Crush with Crush Law on behalf of the applicant, Victoria Park at 12 LLC. Um, they, oops, wrong way, sorry. They are the owners of a three building, 16 unit townhouse that they constructed located at 612 Northeast 12th Avenue in Victoria Park. Why we're here is to request a variance from 47192Z1 which requires that uh, roof mounted structures such as air conditioning, satellite dishes, et cetera, um, must be screened in some way six inches above the top of that roof mounted structure. In this case, it would be AC units. There are 16 located on top of these 16 unit um, townhouse project. Um, this project was a, a very long process in coming to completion. It was actually approved, uh, submitted for DRC in 2013, went through the DRC process, was approved in 2014, master permits for one of the buildings was pulled, then master permits for the other two buildings. Then we went in and did AC revisions based on the energy code changing and the units that were originally spec'd um, were no longer manufactured and no longer met the energy code because of the way that they're constructed and the stands that were required to be used. Um, now we find out at zoning final CO that our AC units are several inches higher than they should be. So the, let me walk you through the property and give you, I've got a lot of visuals so that we can understand. Um, I believe that in the narrative, we've addressed all of the criteria, of the variance, but that's hard to understand without some visuals as to what we're really talking about in black and in, in color, instead of just on an elevation or, or black and white. So as you see, this is just south of the, the, the football fields and the tennis courts in Holiday Park, actually borders onto the park right on 12th Avenue. And if you look at the yellow arrow on your screen, this is the angle at which we took pictures as we walked around the property to show you what the property looks like today as it is completed, TCO'd. This is the last item before we can get our CO. So you see the building from the Southwest view. Beautiful architecture. The architecture, Gus Carbonell is here with us tonight. 
Um, he's used banding and breaking up of the facade to break up this fairly straightforward townhouse project. Um, you see aluminum railings, um, stonework, landscaping is not matured yet, but it will be a fully fleshed out, um, beautiful project. If you look here, this is the cul-de-sac that borders right at the bottom of Holiday Park, looking back down to the, to the south. And you'll see that this is in, in the area on the left hand side is what faces Holiday Park. And this is 12th down the road with we provided and built on street parking with landscaping in there, as was approved through DRC. Now, looking from the park, looking to the south, this is what you see the trees in the park, the trees that we've planted, and balconies that face onto the park to give kind of a backyard experience for the residents. Now, looking from the street to the east, which is 13th, because there are already constructed projects there, you really can't see much. There is a large 35 foot tall building to the south, a small house here, and then another two story project that is on the park just uh, to the north. But you over the top of this roof from a pedestrian scale, you can just see the top of our building back there. Now, if you're looking to the north from 6th, you'll see that there is a single story structure. It's a rental unit, I believe it's a duplex. And you'll see that that is the end of our westernmost building that you can see from, this is standing on sixth. So to remind you that the code requires us to build a screen and how we did it in this was a parapet wall that is actually three feet high, but it requires that parapet wall to be six inches above the top of the roof mounted structure. We weren't able to do that in this situation, but what we believe the intent of this section of the code, which this code has changed over the years from different requirements. You used to have to draw a line from pedestrian scale and certain angle of what you're looking at was amended to this. If you look at a more prescriptive section of our code, which is more current, is the RAC, downtown RAC review and special regulations says mechanical roof equipment should be screened from all grade level views. And we believe in this situation that we can, and, and as a matter of fact, when we failed our zoning final, that comment was made, mechanical equipment visible from right of way. Also that our, the AC units are 10 to 12 inches above the parapet wall. Now we've asked for a larger variance than that. And I will, at the end of my presentation, proffer an amendment and some restrictions to that so that I know that we've advertised a larger variance, I'd like to shrink that down and ask for something even less. What we would like to do is to, on the back side of the parapet walls, is to provide an ACM, or you might notice an ACP, aluminum composite material, aluminum co composite um, panel, attached to the back side of the parapet walls that matches the banding and the architectural that's existing on the building to screen for of these AC units from view from the right of way. There are only four of the 16 that can be seen from the right of way. Now I'm gonna walk you around because I walked through those pictures first. These are exact same pictures and maybe you didn't know what we were looking at. If you look where the yellow arrow is, this is what we're talking about. The tiny little sliver, which from a pedestrian level is I would guess six to eight inches of sliver across there. And I know Bert Ford has been out there and walked the property as well, six to eight inches. Yeah, roughly. So if you don't look for it, you can't see it. But what we propose to do, and I'll show you every angle again, is to propose is to do screening in that ACM panel along the face of there to make it seamless with the front of this facade. If you look under the now leasing sign, we're kind of going to match that banding with that ACM panel to make it a seamless integration. So you won't see the top of those AC units as you look at the building. You'll just see another architectural detail. Same thing, this is the actually same AC units looking from the cul-de-sac into the park. That again, where the yellow arrow is, that's the little sliver that you can see if you go and look at it from a pedestrian level. We propose to screen that as well with a, some that similar product that looks like the face of the building. Again, looking from sixth, that is the little sliver that we're talking about that you can see from sixth. Again, propose to screen that as well. Now, what gets a little trickier, and it's good, we haven't done a detail on it, but we would agree in our variance to submit to the building department and make sure that it meets code is, <laughs> this one's weird. You can see that there's a stairwell. Now that stairwell, which is per legally permitted and allowed, um, is required so that you can have access to the AC units on the roof for maintenance. 
Now, if you look closely enough through the railing of the stairwell, you can see the AC unit. Now, I would argue that it's obstructed, but our client is willing to provide an ACM panel there so that if you look through the stairwell, you'll actually see that banded ACM architectural detail behind there. So you, you'll still see the stairwell because we're allowed to have an external stairwell for access to the roof. Same situation here, looking directly west. If you look through those railings, you can see right behind there, that is the AC unit. We propose to screen that as well with a panel, which of course we would hinge so that if an AC repair technician had to access the ACs, he would climb up that ladder, open the gate and move in. Now, just to summarize where we're talking about, this is the site plan of all three buildings. You'll, at the top of the screen is Northeast 12th Avenue, and we've got one, two, three, and four AC units that are visible. We propose to put the ACM panels on the back of the parapets at, at units one and two, and units three and four are the two that you saw that you can see through the stairwells. And we would put some type of a hinged door at the top there so that if you look through that stairwell, you'd actually see the panel instead of the AC behind it. With that, I'm willing to answer any questions you may have. We feel that we've met the criteria to be granted a variance and I appreciate your time. Let me go out to the board. Thank you very much for your presentation. Gus, do you have anything? Just here for questions? Okay. Mr. Uh, Chair, you need, dis you need disclosures. Oh, I'm sorry. Any disclosures? Uh, I spoke with counsel. Okay. Chad Maxey, I spoke with applicant's counsel. Uh, Mr. McTeague? I spoke with applicant's counsel. Ms. Ellis? I spoke with counsel and I drove over and looked at the property. Mr. Reynolds? None. Mr. Villeneuve? I spoke with counsel and had a site visit. All right, and I also spoke with counsel. Thank you very much for the reminder, Ms. Ellis. Let me start with board questions and I'll start with, with Chad. Any questions? None. Uh, was the was the AC the proper height at when you originally submitted the drawings? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, Mr. And, and, and I will say that it was approved at DRC that way. When we, and it was the master permits and the mechanical permits were approved. When the AC unit changed, we did submit an architect's letter with the new spec sheets and the new equipment that was also approved by the building department. Mr. McTeague? Yes. Any questions? No, I do not. I think he was voting. Ms. Ellis? No questions. Mr. Reynolds? None. Mr. Villeneuve? No questions. And, and I've got one question. It's probably more a question for uh, for Mr. Carbonell. It, Mr. Carbonell and I, and yes, do you he want, did. he was sworn in. He swore. He, they both, they were both sworn in. Um, I, I, I hear the offer to screen with a panel on the staircases, but I'm concerned about the effect of that on the safety of any technician. Do you have any concerns about a technician trying to, on a stairwell that is pretty high, get around a, a screening device when, of course, obviously the stairwell is still in plain view? Uh, Ghost Carbonell, um, no. Uh, if you look at the roof plan, actually the, the view that is on the screen now, the ladder uh, is on the outside face of the building. And because we have a mansard roof, there's actually a, a long walk before you get to where that uh, solid gate will be placed at. Okay. So I uh, just, uh, again, I've got reservations and speaking just for myself and I'm not gonna be making a motion. I wouldn't mind it if, if those two screens were not in the picture, but that will be for the maker of the motion. And, and Mr. Chair, I will tell you, we will go through the building department to get approval for these uh, building permits, obviously. Okay. And if they, it has to meet code. Well, if your presentation is is done, let me open it up for uh, for public comment. Do we have any public comment? Very good. Let me close the the public hearing part of it. 
If there are no additional questions of the board, let me completely close the public hearing and I await a motion. I would like to make a motion to approve uh, case number PLNBOA. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, wrong one. Uh, yeah, PLNBOA 20110002 with the amendment. I want to make sure that, that that second, um, that the the, the second um, uh, variance was removed, right? The second variance was removed. Yeah. Right. To tell you the truth, I lost my sheet. Um, would do you think it'd be better if I read out the request without that variance, or do you think don't don't think fine? you need to at all? Okay, so I can just okay, so should, I'll just start over. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, case number. PLNBOA 20110002 as it meets the requirements. For a, the sorry, issuance of a variance? For the variance. Got it. I've got a motion. Is uh, there a second? Uh, second. The I, applicant, uh, Dwayne Spence, Assistant City Attorney, uh, the applicant also made a proffer with regards to these uh, screening, uh, is, which is not a part which of. Which is not request. within the four corners of the. Of the of the variance application oh not in the motion in part of the motion that was requested is that was that your intention to also accept the proffer as a condition of approval yes okay. and again do we have a second i'm going to come right back to yeah. you in a second Jay. Sure. Sure. second um for this is bridget uh, could i could somebody state again what that proffer was? Because I'm not clear I'm about that. Ask, I'm going to ask Mr. Crush to state that proffer most clearly. Yes. And I think Thank that, you very, very much. And if you notice from the presentation, which I provided a copy to Shaquilla Crawford City mm -hmm. staff, that the page with the map on it that identifies the four units is actually labeled Exhibit A. Maybe the proffer would be that, as stated by Mr. McTeague, uh, Mr. McGinley, Sorry, both Max. <laughs> Max, um, okay. we proffer to screen the units labeled on Exhibit A as one, two, three, and four from public view of the right of way. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, may I call the roll, Mr. Chair? You may. Thank you, thank you for your patience. I'm um, Mr. Villeneuve. Yes. Mr. Reynolds. Yes. Mr. McGinley? Yes. Mr. Maxey? Yes. Vice Chair McTeague? Yes. Ms. Ellis? Yes. Chair Nelson? Yes. There you go, unanimous. Very good. Thank you everyone, much appreciated. Much. Um, any communications to the city commission from the board? I, I know we might have some communication back. I'm not hearing any, Ms. Ma Mr. Malik? Yes, uh, Chair, I just want to bring back, uh, you, you guys have asked us to look into the fence ordinance to for the hide, and I have some information on that. So what uh, we are planning to do is, uh, we are planning to take uh, fence, and there are some other amendments to the code which the commission and the city manager has requested to look uh, on, and we are planning to go before the commission conference in March uh, of 2021 uh, with multiple different suggestions. And if it gets approved by the commission in the uh, conference committee, and then we will proceed after uh, expecting to go in March. So, and the, after that, it would take a few months. Uh, you know, it has to go before the uh, planning and zoning board, uh, and it, it has to be advertised, go before the homeowners association, then go to the planning and zoning board, then to the city commission for two times uh, before it gets approved. So, so this board has heard, I think, more than one uh, um, fence height variance application in the last six months that would be affected by this change of code. Could you let those applicants know that the city is in, is looking at a potential change of code? The new applicants or the one which are already the the ones who have already been heard because we've got some that were denied variances. We should probably let them know that, that the city is taking a look at, at potentially changing code. Okay. 
definitely. We, we will go back and check a uh, few months, couple of months, and then you know we'll we'll try to inform you. Mohammed, would um, we be able to see those proposed changes ahead of the March submission? And uh, maybe what? at the February board meeting. Uh, no, actually, we will be start working on it. Uh, you know, once the commission gives us a go ahead, which we are trying to bring, you know, some suggestions from our side, and we can, uh, you know, after March, we'll be start working on it. You know, how and what. Few of the suggestions, what we are doing is for the code. We think, I mean, again, this is nothing set in stone. Uh, what we, I think, Bert and we have, we are thinking is just to make the uh, height of the fence measured uh, wherever FEMA allows it as per the FEMA requirements. Do you know what they allow as of now, what they recommend? It's different at different, different places. Uh, X5, if it's X zone, you know, it's, uh, there is no elevation. If it's five, it's five, it's six, it's six, seven or seven, you know, so every, every property, you know, every few properties, it changes. So FEMA elevation, you know, we cannot, every property is different. We cannot predict. But what if what if uh, a person was trying to elevate their property, you know, above the minimum required, yeah, of minimum lack. requirements of the of the floodplain? What if they were trying that, to get that, to a, a that, standard where they that, were not? That's why we have sent. Okay. You know, I, again, you know, I'm, I'm, I I cannot comment on anything. Got it, got it. This is one of the things you never know, mind that that's why wherever they want to take it five feet higher, but your fence elevation will measure. Got it. All right. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you very much. Anything for good and welfare? If not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, again, board, uh, what I have just said is just our thought. Again, this is nothing is in written. Right. I don't want it to hold it. my feet. You said so, and something else. <laughs> motion to adjourn. Motion. Thank you. So moved. Everybody have a good evening. You too. Thank you.